Howdy, howdy, everyone. Can I say howdy, DC? Do I have any, na any natural National Harbor people here, residents here? Okay, okay. <laughs> Just checking. Um, anyone go on the Ferris wheel? Nice. Uh, someone, I saw a graphic with a Ferris wheel with a, like a WordPress logo on it. I was like, man, we got to do that someday. Sometimes it'd be a WordPress, sometimes it'd be an M, sometimes it'd be an E, I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to talk just a little bit about WordPress in 2023 and beyond. Uh, for those who I haven't met yet, my name is Matt Mullenweg, and about 20 years ago now, um, out of a single comment on my blog, uh, Mike Little and I started working on what would become WordPress, and we did the first release, uh, was it May, I think, of 2003? Um, and it's been kind of amazing watching WordPress grow and also growing up myself alongside all y'all. <laughs> How much has changed over the past 20 years? You've seen me in a variety of hairstyles and beard lengths. <laughs> I'm now in my more conservative, like trying to look like a CEO look. <laughs> uh, but anyway, a few weeks ago, we did our version 6.3 release on August 8th. Who was involved with contributing to that, by the way? Raise your hand. Let's get a round of applause for these folks. Please stand up, actually. Yeah. You worked on 6.3. Quick, quick, come on, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you saw a few of them, but there were actually over 640 contributors to that release. 207 of them were completely new contri to, to contributing to WordPress. And we did about 1,100 features, bug fixes, enhancements, performance improvements, accessibility improvements. Um, it's a lot to talk about, so uh, let's take a quick look at it. So we got a really fun video, a really beautiful one. Some cool music. There are thousands and thousands of little details in there. Um, like, notice the space theme, like a little homage to our opening keynote from NASA, which is pretty cool. For those who don't know, the NASA website's coming over to WordPress and getting some really cool stuff. Um, my favorite is probably the command palette, which is essentially like a command line for WordPress. You do uh, Control K, Command K, right? And immediately go and like jump to any part of it. It's pretty cool. Um, one of our most feature-packed releases ever. Uh, but WordPress never rests, so right around the corner on November 7th, we're going to do version 6.4, which is coming out. It's going to be our, yeah, <laughs> we, we're keeping up our, our pace of three major releases per year, 
we tried to move it to four, but it seems like three is the right cadence for us right now. Um, 6.4 is going to be uh, similar to, I think it was 5.6, and that's going to be an underrepresented gender release squad. And there's some cool new features that are going to be in it. First I'll talk about is the new default theme, which will be 2024. This was actually introduced on Contributor Day. Um, we're trying to be uh, tailor this theme not just for sort of the SMB use case or site creator use case, but actually for creators and bloggers um, in this. Uh, we had 31 people contribute to it at Contributor Day the other day. And you can read about the theme, and yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> you can read about it and get involved on the make.wordpress.org slash core p2. Um, other cool features that are coming up are font management. So what you're going to see here is actually um, you'll go, you can, it's got the fonts that are built in. This is a library actually coming from Google right now, of uh, other fonts. And when you click on this, what it's actually going to do is import those files from Google, upload them to your, sideload them to your site so they can load completely locally, which is something we heard from, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something uh, particular our European uh, WordPress community members have been big on. Um, hot linking from Google is actually good for performance if it's already cached for other people, but then the loading on your own, like no request go to Google. So people like that. As we heard from some applause, I wouldn't expect any applause on that one. <laughs> Next up, simple, but I'm really glad we're getting this in the core, which is image lightbox. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with it, a lightbox is this idea that it's, it's always never been really great in WordPress. What happens when you click on an image or an attachment? And uh, what we're showing here, I think we're going to change the name because right now it's like called behaviors and that's kind of a weird thing to call it. But <laughs> uh, basically what will happen is like now on the front end, uh, when you click on an image, it will kind of go full screen and zoom. And then you can navigate with keyboards. It works great and beautiful on mobile. And you can also zoom in further on that. Ta-da! <laughs> Simple, but you've needed plugins for this forever. <laughs> and so having like a super lightweight implementation in core is uh, pretty exciting. So that's two of the features we want to talk about. The rest is being defined. So if you want to be part of defining what's in 6.4, uh, please get involved. You can go to make.wordpress.org slash core and uh, join our WordPress.org Slack. You know, we've got different channels for different interests in WordPress, including one that I'm about to announce a little bit later, a new one. Um, but anyway, so with the end of 6.3, we are coming to the essentially like, not finish line, but I'll call it checkbox for uh, the second phase of Gutenberg. For those who don't remember, when we first announced Gutenberg many, many years ago, we said there's going to be four phases of its development. The first is focusing on the editor itself. So taking our old classic document-based editor, um, which was really hard to like align images and move embeds around. You had to use short codes to like do a lot of different richer functionality and moved out all the blocks. Um, so that was phase one. Phase two, which we call customization, is making it so yeah, those blocks were usable not just inside a post or a page, but you could actually modify the entire site. And that's you're seeing a lot of new block themes, everything we just saw in that video. You know, you're able to do things now by just clicking and moving things around that in prior years, you would have needed to know CSS or hire a developer or something like that. And that's part of our mission to democratize publishing. WordPress is kind of like the original no-code tool, right? Uh, before we're like, I mean, literally when I first started uh, blogging, like we, I'd like upload files and modify a file and upload it and move things around. And then like the first CMS has automated a lot of that. Um, it's all part of this kind of like efficient curve where things that used to be hard um, what technology is beautiful at doing is you know, making it more accessible to a larger and larger audience. Uh, phase three is now what we're heading into, which is actually the phase uh, I think I've been saying is the one that I'm most excited about because it's all about collaboration. So imagine just now taking WordPress and editing something from being single player to multiplayer. So what you're seeing on the screen here, it's looping, is those two, the little purple and the green, you might not be able to tell, but those actually have names underneath. I actually can't see what the names are. <laughs> but that's basically two people editing the same post at the same time. Who's ever overridden someone else that's been editing? <laughs> you know, thank goodness for revisions. But now you'll be able to, whether it's sharing a draft with someone and getting feedback on it, whether it's, you know, 
collaborating on designing something together. Uh, maybe if you're like a, an agency or developer, you can invite a client into it directly, get on the phone with them and talk through it as you move things around. Like it's so, so powerful what you'll be able to do with this. And again, like I said, moving WordPress from being kind of a single player to a multiplayer tool. Um, of course, anything that builds on top of Gutenberg, which you know all the best page builders and everyone is doing now, will get all these features for free as we start to build them in the core. And it's also really cool that just built into like browser technologies now, we can do this in a fairly efficient and in some places even kind of peer-to-peer -peer browser way, which is pretty neat. So uh, it's we're just now getting started with this. So if you want to have an impact on WordPress, go to make.wordpress.org slash phase three is where we're going to be talking about this. So it'll be all about collaboration. We're actually going to be redesigning some of the admin to modernize it a little bit. <laughs> um, the First big redesign, probably since MP6, if anyone remembers that. Uh, it's going to be workflows, so like allowing plugins or maybe even some stuff in core to register different workflows. Like, for example, maybe this role can edit the page, but someone else has to approve it to publish it. Um, the command palette, uh, revisions, we're going to get really much cooler on revisions. Block library, media library. I'm also really excited about finally looking at the media library. <laughs> like in that video, when you saw it, uh, everything was looking really modern until the media picker popped up, right? <laughs> and they were like, oh, this feels a little, this a little 2000s. <laughs> so I'm glad to return to that. And also integrate things like Openverse, um, who don't, those aren't familiar with it. Um, we actually took over the Creative Commons search engine. Um, it's now hosted on WordPress.org, and it's called Openverse, which is you know, a beautiful library that indexes the whole web to find Creative Commons licensed content that you can use on your site uh, with attribution or, or not if it's not required. Um, so that is what is coming with phase three. Looking forward to seeing some of y'all on the P2 Slacks and at future contributor days as we define this together and start to build it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Have one of these. Um, got just kind of two final things I wanted to end with. Uh, oh, that was loud. <laughs> Thank you, Taika. <laughs> um, one really cool thing happened uh, the other day here at WordCamp US, and I wanted to tell a story about it, which um, one thing that makes not just open source, but I think particularly the WordPress community really powerful is how people come together. And uh, you see it even at like the booths and at the parties, like uh, companies that in theory compete with each other um, are spending time together, sharing more stories, often even now sharing code, right? We all work together on some of the same common code. And it's kind of a beautiful example of what I think I was really originally inspired by open source and I've done my best to try to bring into the world and simplify with my own companies. It's this idea of sort of like a positive sum capitalism where we can all win together and find areas to work together, because we all have so much more in common than we have uh, difference. Um, one thing that has always been a little tricky about WordPress is that it's both a good and bad thing, is that um, there can be so many plugins that do the same thing. Um, I say good and bad because that's great, because it allows innovation that can happen. You kind of get almost like a, an evolutionary uh, like uh, natural selection. <laughs> some plugins thrive over the long term, some kind of fade away. Um, they inspire each other. Good competition actually makes everyone better. Um, bad sometimes in that as a WordPress user, like if you go one plugin, you might be kind of locked in to it. Or there might not be interop. This was a big part of the inspiration for Graydon Gutenberg because we were seeing a lot of innovation from different kind of page builders and other things. But I started to hear from plugins like SEO plugins that said, hey, we're having to like rewrite our plugin to integrate like with 10 different builders. Like, can you create some standards in core, something that we can all agree on, which became Gutenberg and Blocks, that everyone can just build on top of. And then like the data models, everything are the same. So what happens, um, we're calling this WordPress LMS. Who's familiar with what a LMS stands for? So oh, a lot of people actually. More people that the new our democratized publishing mission. <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't know, and LMS is a, stands for a learning management system. And it's a way to basically adopt the content management system for like online courses in ways that could be adjunct to something in person. They could have quizzes. They could have units, modules. There's a million different things. Anyway, this week, uh, Tutor LMS, LearnDash, Lifter LMS, and Sensei all got together. So 
So these are four different plugins um, that provide LMS top solutions. And um, the conversation was around what common data models can we do? So it's kind of two tracks. One was like a, within the WordPress world, like can we actually agree on like using some of the same SQL uh, format? So like we have common like column names and tables since we're doing some very similar things or we can at least create some abstractions between these different LMSs, could we make it so that there's not a lock-in and that users can get the freedom and choice to switch between these without having to port over all their content? Then second is that are there industry standards? Um, I didn't know a lot of this, but I learned some. There's like something called SCORM, I guess. Uh, there's some other like, was it XAPI? Or like there's a few different things there around industry standards around like what other software might be doing or even some governments like um, ask people to, to put their content into. And are we, as a set of you know, plugins within WordPress, again, we're always about user freedom and user choice. So are we doing everything we can to make sure we interop with those standards, have import or export or converters or things like that? Um, the group came together. Uh, we decided to kick it off with a Slack channel. So there is now hashtag LMS in the WordPress.org Slack. <laughs> um, it's, it was kind of fun because it's you know at the brainstorm stage. Well, obviously, there's other LMS plugins as well that weren't able to make it to WordCamp or weren't included yet. But now everyone involved in this space or who's developing a solution around it can come together, kind of agree on some de facto standards. We'll turn it into a document on a make blog. And, um, and then essentially now in the future, if you're choosing an LMS plugin, there'll probably be like a badge or something that folks who like apply to these standards and have the interop will have that badge. And so you'll be able to make an informed choice as a consumer in choosing, again, freedom is not just always about the license. In, you know, in WordPress, we have the GPL license, the four freedoms. Sometimes it's about like the practical interop. So very excited to that. And let's give a round of applause to the folks who came together on that. <laughs> and I'd be lying if I tell you it didn't get me thinking about like, how can we get this kind of interop in our SEO plugins <laughs> and the builder plugins and probably a bunch of areas y'all are familiar with that I don't even know about. Like how can we get, even when there's going to be different plugins, you know, we definitely want canonical plugins for some areas, and we're going to do a lot more of that. But where there might be lots of different solutions, maybe dozens even, how can we get them maybe using some, agreeing on some data models or something like that so that there's a more standard and performant way uh, to put all this in? And to me, this is really about long-term thinking. You know, Like I said, we're about 20 years into WordPress, and we're thinking for the coming decades and perhaps even beyond, how do we create a thriving, so go back to Josefa's word, um, community, software base, something that's always evolving. Uh, one of my favorite uh, inspirations here is uh, there's a cool foundation called the Long Now Foundation. Uh, they're involved with, you might have heard about this 10,000 year clock. Has anyone seen this? So cool. I actually got to visit it. It's like in a secret location in West Texas and they're trying to design something, of course, thinking on 10,000 years um, that can survive perhaps even a collapse of civilization. <laughs> So the clock is kind of interesting in that it only shows the time when you kind of wind it up. So they're imagining like 5,000 years from now, someone might stumble across this cave and go through it and like kind of figure out what this thing is. And the, it's almost like a Rosetta Stone like way where it like explains how the clock works and how tide keeping uh, it kind of ties into some solar energy and stuff. Uh, but it needs to not be like solar panels because that might not be uh, as longevity. Uh, the other fun thing that Long Now Foundation does is when they talk about all of their years on their website, they say like, we were founded in 01996. <laughs> Which is really nice, right? Because obviously at some point we're gonna to need to talk about years in five digits, not four. So uh, they're planning ahead. <laughs> it's like for WordPress, I remember when we switched from being like int to big int, I was like, oh yeah, now we're ready. <laughs> we got 64 bits of storage now with, uh, <laughs> big int is 64, right? Who knows my SQL here? <laughs> I should have looked that up before the talk. <laughs> um, other thing we just did, um, my company Automatic on WordPress.com, we just yesterday announced a 100-year hosting plan, uh, which was, yeah, thank you. <laughs> this was um, both a really interesting exercise as a company, like what would it mean to provide service for 100 years? 
what's it mean on top of the things we're built on? Like for example, domains, you can only register 10 years at a time. So what we're doing is when someone signs up for this, we're gonna register it for 10 years, then add a year on top of the 10 every year until 90. <laughs> and then those last 10 years, it'll kind of come down. Hopefully we'll get some renewals on this. <laughs> um, it got us talking a lot about like, what's this for? And it was interesting how different people brought different ideas. Like some people really thought about, this is something you buy like at the end of your life. Um, actually, one of the ways I was thinking about it, because I, I've had some more God children being born recently. I think I'm up to 14 or 15 now. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what well, can I get them when they're born? <laughs> you know, I've been buying domains for them. But I was like, uh, okay, but how cool would it be that, hey, now for 100 years, you both have a domain and something to run on it. Um, but it was really difficult to think what this thing should cost and thinking about like both what are the known and unknown cost for it. Uh, we ended up deciding on $38,000, which in some ways is a lot. Like that's, a, that's a really nice Camry or Corolla or something. <laughs> uh, in some ways, I wonder if it's too low because like we try to model an inflation and different you know, cost of underlying things like uh, the dot-com registration or domain registrations. Um, but again, like what does it look like? to provide this service, including with support, 50 years, 80 years from now, what technology are we using? Uh, will we have to do like VR support or metaverse support? Well, you know, it's kinda, but those thought exercises are really interesting. It also got me thinking about uh, lifetime licenses, uh, which I think we should stop doing in the WordPress world. <laughs> um, also, like if you've, ever, if you've ever worked with an accountant or an acquirer, they don't like when you have those <laughs> because essentially it's an open-ended commitment, including often with support. Um, how do you re recognize that revenue? There's all sorts of reasons that I think, you know, offer a 20-year plan or something. <laughs> but don't, I think when you're saying lifetime, it sort of cheapens the word. And so if we're really thinking the long term and what promises we're making to our customers, I think we should re-examine those practices as well. Um, so... I'd encourage you all, like as we're in the United States Capitol, or kind of right next to it, <laughs> but we're going there for the social later, right? Are you all excited about the Smithsonian Museum? How cool is that? Uh, gosh, if you have any extra time in the DC area, the museums here are, are really like one of a kind in the world. And it's pretty amazing to walk around the architecture, the monuments, um, I really admire about this city how there is um, a lot of honoring for the past, and I think from the founding fathers as well, like thinking about the long term. You know, as I'll butcher another quote from some brothers like, democracy, it's yours if you choose to treat it well, choose to keep it well. What was that quote? I forget it. Best system as long as you can keep it. Um, there's, there's all these sorts of things that um, kind of show also like, the need for iteration, <laughs> the need to be able to patch things like the Constitution. <laughs> and you have to get two-thirds committers from the states, right? <laughs> That's a lot of LGTM, right, <laughs> on those pull requests. Um, I also think about like more how open source can influence things like how legislation is created. You know, you hear about how people do scripts or how bills are made and they're emailing around PDFs and <laughs> printing things out at the last minute. Like, how much cooler could something like source control or Git or something else apply to some of these areas? Some of what we learned in software about working together, both in person, but also from around the world, apply to these areas. So um, think about that long-term thinking, you know, as you uh, admire the thing, beautiful stuff around us at the Smithsonian and hopefully get to explore a little bit later. And uh, that's where we're going to end it, because I don't want this to be too long-term of a talk. <laughs> and uh, thank you. I'm going to invite Josefa back on the stage, and we're going to do some questions and maybe some answers. <laughs> Great job. Come join me in my office. I also have no idea how the Slido thing is going to work. And this is an experiment. It's much like being at this venue is an experiment. <laughs> One we might not continue. Yes. <laughs> um, but, okay, we've got this slide. Yeah, this is actually not the slide. This is oh. something else. Um, we can't see that thingy where we see all the questions. And so this is here so we can see it. Oh, cool. Sorry, I'm just doing housekeeping while you all are watching. Um, yes, so you can scan this QR code or go to slido.com and put in that number with the hash slash pound or no. Anyone? You got it. You can figure it out. I believe in you. It's kind of a cool Easter egg that we have 1770 or 776. Oh, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> Oh, it is 1776, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think you'll, you can also vote on the questions. So part of what we were trying to do with this was allow people, like whatever, so this is now, I won't feel bad if you all look at your phones right now. <laughs> Let's see how good this Wi-Fi is. <laughs> uh, and kind of vote up the questions, because that way, uh, one thing we're experimenting with this is it's not just who gets to the mic fat first. Like we're trying to hear what most of you would like to uh, know. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. If this gets it's to 10 here. votes, I'll answer it. Oh, 13. Oh, no. Okay, okay. It's also here if you would like to see it. Yeah, yeah. So first question is, do you uh, still blame Nason? Um, we're going to have to explain this one. Uh, yeah. Andrew Nason, please stand up. <laughs> Should I blame you for this question? <laughs> um, this is, a, this is a fun double entendre as well, because uh, I don't know, does Git have the same command, but the SVN, you could write SVN blame and see who is responsible or the last person who committed a particular line of code. <laughs> and it's kind of fun to see like, oh, where'd this function come from? And the most humbling thing as a developer is when you do that and it's your own name that shows up. <laughs> who wrote this? Oh, me. <laughs> um, I still have a number of lines in the WordPress code base as well, which is both uh, exciting and a little scary. Uh, but uh, we no longer blame Nason for things. And in fact, I would generally like to announce a jubilee <laughs> of blame. I I've just heard a few in some conversations or something like, oh, I heard you don't like this company or heard WordPress doesn't like this or that. And um, I would just like officially for 2023 to reset all of that to neutral. <laughs> so if you think I like something or don't like something, let's reset that to zero and just build from scratch because, you know, we're not gonna make it another 20 years. We're carrying around a lot of baggage, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> this is one of my favorite uses of the word Jubilee and most of the time no one knows what I'm talking about. So maybe no. it's just me and you on this stage that know what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, so look it up. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, should we go by like top voted one or how do you wanna do this? However you want to choose. You wanna take this top one? The what is the greatest existential threat to WordPress? Sure. Or actually any of these four you want to do. Okay. Um, I can take what is the greatest existential threat to WordPress. Um, so, sorry, I'm trying to figure out which hat to have on. Do I have my admin operations hat? Uh, or do I have my WordPress community hat? Okay, so here's the thing. The greatest threat to WordPress as a community is always... Um, whether or not we can still get together and collaborate in, um, in an effective way. Hmm. Uh, because so much of our community is built on the way we get together and the way we collaborate. I really loved at the community summit how we saw people talking through really contentious conversations hmm. and still like respecting one another as people for the most part. Yeah. And, <laughs> and really like, trying to address the root issue as opposed to resorting to just kind of general um, ad hoc sort of attacks on each other. And the way that we're coming back together um, post-COVID and the way mm. that um, we are kind of looking at the future of our event series, the event series does so much work on behalf of this project. I've said it a couple of times. There's a podcast somewhere if someone wants to like share it so other people know what I'm talking about. But it does like 17 different jobs on mm. its own, these event series. It brings people into the project and it teaches them how to use WordPress. It teaches them how to work with each other, how to work remotely, how to work online. Like it, it does so many things. Um, and so I think that um, a little bit the way that, that we are at 50% reactivation of our meetup groups. And I really, mm. really encourage everyone to like, if you don't know what a meetup group is, or if your local meetup group is just not meeting and you can't figure out who's helping them meet, like get out there and do something about it because this yeah. is the lifeblood of what makes this project work and what makes open source work. And so that, to my mind, is the greatest existential threat to WordPress, especially in the current um, climate that we're in. Yeah, thank you. What I like about that is the greatest threat, I don't think, is any competitor. It's ourselves, <laughs> which is exactly what you just said. Yeah. Um, I'll jump to a, a little easier one that we could go quickly, a book you enjoyed recently. Um, I'll name two. 
Uh, Ken Liu's Paper Menagerie, <laughs> one of my favorites all time. He was the speaker this morning. If you weren't here, uh, which I can tell a lot of you weren't, <laughs> uh, check out that uh, video as soon as it's up. And of course, you can always cheat by going to live stream and rewinding. <laughs> uh, really special talk. And um, a more recent one, and actually, I, I thought about him here as a speaker, maybe we'll do it at a future work camp, is uh, Will Gader, I think his name is he pronounced, called Unreasonable Hospitality. And uh, the reason I thought that could be interesting to bring in to the WordPress community is just like, we all do service to our customers, to our clients, to each other, to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the WordPress users. Like, and it's a book about, um, he's one of the sort of two people along with uh, Daniel Hume behind 11 Madison Park, which kind of, wrote, it's a story of how they rose from kind of like a brasserie in New York that not a lot of people knew about to literally being the number one restaurant in the world uh, oh. on the 50 top restaurants list. And so, and they did that not just through amazing food, but also amazing hospitality. And one of the first to really like, innovate on that. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned for the WordPress community. Any books you want to throw in there? So I'm in the middle of a book right now. I um, have been feeling like I was missing reading, but ha I've been in a reading rut. And so if anyone mm. has books to recommend. I got out of my reading rut on accident. I was going through <laughs> my library app and accidentally checked a book out, so I'm reading it. And it's, <laughs> 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 whoopsie. Uh, it's called Eleanor Oliphant. Oliphant is completely fine, something? It's, ah. yeah? Yes. And um, it starts out in a, in a kind of dark place, but also talks about like the power of community and how mm. one or two people helping someone can bring them together past things that, are, that they're struggling with. I'm only about 40% of the way through, but it, it is, it's nice. It's mm. a, it was a nice accidental checkout of my book. Mm. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have recommendations, you can just share somehow. Yeah. Okay, number one here from Jess. What does the future of WordPress look like if search engines move from links to AI-generated responses? I think about this all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been spending a lot more time in San Francisco. Um, been talking to a lot of the AI companies, OpenAI, MidJourney, um, who else, Anthropic, like the, basically embedding really deeply there because, I, again, I think it's the future. Um, I told you nine days before ChatGPT came out <laughs> to really pay attention to AI. The rest of the world since that release, that was kind of the, uh, uh, what would you call that moment when everyone started paying attention to something? Like the, the break, maybe the Netscape the moment or something. The panic, the excitement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying words that you know. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, so one thing that I'll say from all of those conversations is that the folks making this, um, although these initial versions do kind of like, again, like uh, <laughs> if it's just giving the whole answer, there's no reason to visit the site. It's interesting to see the experiments on things like uh, Microsoft's Bard, where they're trying to do attribution a lot better. And it's very imperfect now, but I can tell you that every single one of these um, companies um, is very much thinking about both how they attribute and then maybe also how they do like micropayments or something like that. Mm -hmm. So like places where content came from uh, or creators. Um, and also how they can enable creators to like, you know, create more and uh, train models on your own stuff. Kind of like what uh, Ken attempted to do with a Ken bot. It's way better now. <laughs> and, uh, and so how that could be like a co-pilot or like an assistant editor for you or something like that um, available on demand. Um, the, uh, so I think the future of WordPress is actually more exciting than ever because the, uh, the places where you're referred to or the visit or being an authority about these things, um, something that becomes cited or maybe even directed to. Perhaps even a future of WordPress looks like where um, we're providing the API so that, uh, let's say you asked a, question, asked a question to ChatGPT, it could call out to your website to run an additional query to maybe get results for items in your store or something like that. Um, so I think there's actually gonna be a lot of integrations and I don't know if it was obvious from that 100-year thing, but I think having your own domain is really important. <laughs> and uh, we should all be thinking about like, what our homes on the web look, uh, look like, feel like, and also like, that sort of search for differentiation. 
Like it was already a little bit on the social networks. I think when people are in like chat boxes all day, that's not the final interface for these things. Mm -hmm. And what's it going to look like when maybe you talk to something, but then it takes you in a browser directly to something. So maybe it's not like you're in a chat box. You're, it's just like a little Siri-like icon that pops up on your desktop or something. So yeah. um, I think that might be one of the models. But again, I wouldn't try to predict anything in AI more than like two months in advance. And even then, you feel a little like who knows what's going to happen. Well, too much. Yeah. Uh, let's see. When these are anonymous, I can't tell who's asking. I realize that's the point. <laughs> Unless, is there someone named anonymous here? I know. So, I, hi. Uh, nice to, nice to finally meet you. <laughs> oh, okay. And what was your name? Blake. Blake. So Blake asked the accessibility standards question. We can skip to that one. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that more Gutenberg developers are aware of accessibility standards? Um, well, talk to them. They're here. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of a tricky question because it assumes they don't know about accessibility standards. <laughs> and I would actually argue that they care about it quite a bit. Did you have a follow-up there? Or? Sure. So let me try to repeat that so, because people can't hear you. We have no mics here. So let me try to, is that all right if I try to summarize? So um, the accessibility team that met at the Contributor Day felt like the Gutenberg developers were maybe thinking about accessibility later on in the process and tickets were being created and testing after a feature was developed and not early enough. Um, I, I will say again that your question assumes that they're not doing this. So it's a little bit like, when did you stop? beating your wife type question. And <laughs> on behalf of the Gutenberg developers, I will say they deeply care about accessibility. They can name to you all the standards, and they're still going to mess it up. And so there will always be a, a process. So I would say if there are certain things, like if you literally believe they don't know about WCAG 2.1 or something like that, like let's do a session and get together and talk to them. Or maybe like just reach out to the people who you feel like are doing a bad job at this and say, hey, can we do a Zoom about like XYZ? And, Everyone always wants to learn. Um, I will say that coming at it from like a, why are you doing this wrong is probably not the best place to start. Uh, or why don't you care about this is, is not a good place to start. I would start maybe a little bit more with like, hey, you know, I'm seeing the same kind of ticket come up over and over again. Like how can we maybe get to this earlier or someplace like that. So, um, yeah. That was Gutenberg developers are great, and we just want to make sure you keep getting greater. -er. The other thing you do is become a Gutenberg developer. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I encourage everyone to learn JavaScript deeply. I think we're seven years into that now. <laughs> and so, like, if you have a uh, background or passion for an area, whether it's design, accessibility, usability, testing, like, I'd say learning a bit of JavaScript, you can actually get involved with these things directly, which is pretty exciting. Oh, All right, next up. There are a ton. Okay. Yep. That one. Can you speak more about where you see the design of the WP admin dashboard going? Let me take this one. Yeah. Um, there are some posts out about it. There are some posts. And mm -hmm. what, will those be on Make Core? Those are on make.wordpress.org slash I believe design. Okay. Yep. That's a yes on design. Slash design. You can mm -hmm. leave out the I believe. Correct. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the. For me, it's really about what I'm actually thinking about most in the admin is uh, how much knowledge it presupposes. So we have amazing documentation and tutorials and learn and everything like that, but it's always someplace else. It relies on someone clicking on the help thing or knowing to go to the documentation or something like that. And there's so many opportunities to be in line mm. with the interface. Just a few extra words. Um, could be really, really powerful, or thinking about how we name things. Yeah. So I had a great conversation with Rich as we were going through the slides earlier. Like, okay, you know, this is called behaviors. 
you know, what does that mean? <laughs> behavior is like, when I think of that word, what do I think of? Like, I think of maybe like a kid getting into trouble at school. Or <laughs> and then you go into that, it says default, no behavior. No behavior, yeah. <laughs> and then light box. Each options. of those, like, what does that mean if you don't know what it means? <laughs> Even the word light box is kind of a, a jargon. It's a terminology. As I was going through the slide, I made sure to like try to explain what a light box was. So if you didn't know, you would kind of know that means like, oh, a little inline thing where you click and it pops up without going to another page. And, um, so if that's what we're doing when we teach WordPress to someone, can we just say that in the original name of it? And can we put some of that in line? Um, the other place I've been thinking about this a lot that I'm excited to work on. So personally, I'm thinking a ton about media and then actually comment moderation. Uh, because I realized that like spam is starting to get pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. I think I got my first LLM spam. Uh, maybe it was written by those spam cans in the art gallery. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it was a really good comment that was totally contextual to my blog post and a little unusually long. <laughs> it's like four paragraphs. And, uh, you know, from an IP address I'd never got anything from before. I'd never got a comment from this person. And then, of course, a website that was a bit spammy. <laughs> um, and so, I, but... Like how easy would it be if I was brand new to blogging to not really realize that what this was was an automated comment that was just trying to get a backlink to the website. And so like what could we do to show that comment to maybe show the reputation of the website and to like say maybe, hey, sometimes people leave comments just to get links. So <laughs> like look at this with a second eye or like, you know, see if they have a gravatar or not or something like that. Like what's yeah. different things we could teach them? Yeah, so that particular thing, like how to get help information into the dashboard in better places for people who are in current need of help as opposed to like trying to figure it out in a handbook came up in the community summit quite a bit. And there cool. were a lot of people that were very interested in helping to kind of research that, help us get that figured out. I think that's a great thing to include in that redesign. Yeah. Cool. I heard a yes. Thank you, whoever you are. So think about that as well. As y'all go through the WordPress interface, try to look at it with a beginner's mind and uh, ask yourself, or when you're teaching other people WordPress, which I hope you're doing frequently, like what words do you find yourself using or explaining things? And actually a really cool way that anyone can contribute, right? <laughs> because this kind of like, what to call things and what to name things is, uh, as who said it, Simon, one of the two hard things in computer science, mm -hmm. naming things, caching, and off by one errors. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, like, what can we do around that? Um, so, cool. Uh, LMS question. Long-term planning is great, and the LMS improvements will be awesome. How much support can we get behind a project like the Fields API, which is making progress? Um, did you even work on the Fields API at the contributor day? We didn't have anything around it? I, I saw a yeah. hand and a half. Okay. So maybe that's also something, you know, WordCamp Asia is coming up. And there's also other WordCamps we contributed today. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could do like a little table on that or something. Um, I, I have to admit, I don't, haven't seen the latest with field API. So if it's making progress, I'm not aware of the latest, latest. Um, this is, you know, uh, as you might have seen, like Dribbble is actually um, exploring Gutenberg. And so it might be actually really, really cool if Drupal adopts Gutenberg which I think is right now the best thing about WordPress. So I was also looking like, well, what's the best thing about Drupal we could adopt? <laughs> and they have like some awesome custom, they call it CCK, custom content mm -hmm. kit, I think. They call it Fields API. They, they call, call it Fields, Fields API? <laughs> oh, in Drupal it's called Fields API now? Did it used to be called CCK? Oh, it did, okay, all right. Um, I'm just old school. Thank you. I yeah, think my Drupal or originally drop.org user number is like in the hundreds or something. <laughs> oh. uh, it was very That's early good. on. Uh, on the Drupal front. It actually predates WordPress by a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll check that out. I'm gonna tell you a secret because it's a secret to us because we can't see what's in here. There are 87 questions in this queue. Oh, Yep. And we don't have that much time left. We so. have 35 minutes. We are not fast question answerers, Matt and I. Let's try to end about five. Okay. Yeah, so let's call it 15 minutes. <laughs> Uh, just because we've been sitting for a while. And I like, also don't know when I got that text, so it could have oh. been. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, We're ending at five. You want to read this top one? Sure. Advice for developers on smaller agency teams that are having trouble keeping up. 
I have a top-down suggestion and a bottom-up suggestion. The top-up, suge top-down suggestion is smaller agencies. Um, why not have a, a host your own learning day inside mm. your teams, like inside your company? I know that if it's like three or four people, it feels kind of weird, but also like that's the best number of people to learn with. You don't have to feel too stupid because you're not around 150 people in the internet. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah, you can learn a lot by just like puzzling through problems together. But then the, the bottom up suggestion is, yeah, go over to learn.wordpress.org. Um, that is the newest extension of the training team in the WordPress project. And there is a lot of stuff that is in small chunks. And so you can see like little bits as you go, um, as you need them, just like, I don't know. I, I wanna call them like tidbits, morsels of education, because <laughs> I, think, I think I'm hungry, but um, yeah. That's, that's what I would suggest. I know it's hard to keep up with all of it all the time, though. Yeah. I'm going to suggest a really awesome podcast, too, oh. hosted by someone here on stage with me. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WordPress Briefing. <laughs> <laughs> Weekly podcast. You can subscribe to it in Pocket Cast, which is open source, or your favorite podcatcher. Yep. And um, it's on WordPress.org slash news as well. Yep, slash news slash podcast. And I have listened to, I believe, every single episode. Oh, wow. Um, uh, they're short, they're sweet, you get some Josepha, and it's a good way, I think, to keep up with what's going on in the WordPress uh, yeah. world. So That's true, that's true. Uh, thank you, Amy, who asked that question. Next up, we have Awesome Paul. <laughs> good to differentiate from all the other Pauls, I guess. Yeah. Or, I, actually, I think all the Pauls in this room are awesome. If you were starting all over with WordPress and still starting where you did, what would you do differently? Oh. Um, the number one thing I would do differently is... Uh, change the column name of ID in the post table. <laughs> That's quite a number one. All right. Um, it's, it's capitalized. It's also just ID. It should be post underscore ID, which is the convention we took with naming future column names. I actually think maybe our migration stuff is good enough that we could change this now. And you know, we've had the database abstraction layers for a while. But uh, man, that drives me crazy. <laughs> I love a good... Uh, I love a good column table structure. <laughs> Still love SQL. Um, something I originally learned thanks to my sister here, Charlene. Um, <laughs> she's a professional genealogist, but was doing genealogy research more than 20 years ago, so before WordPress started, and before there was really awesome stuff you could upload your genealogy files to and things. And so uh, we made a website, mullenwig.com, still up there, uh, that I was trying to post all her genealogy research. It turns out a great way to learn about relational databases is relational family trees. <laughs> and so and you, you can kind of see me learning SQL on there because it's like, here's a page of a person. And then here's everyone else with the first name, you know, Lewis. <laughs> and everyone else born in 1959. And everyone else, you know, like sort of different, you know, pivoting and stuff. So um, I, I think this is a skill actually that it would be a good sort of thing. I feel like some newer developers aren't as familiar with just some base to SQL and optimization, learning how to use its plain queries and stuff. So maybe a good thing if you haven't looked at that in a while to loop back to. I wasn't there when it started, mm -hmm. but I would like to add one that I would start. I would start doing the WordCamps earlier. Ah. Oh. I think that the thing that really differentiates our project from everybody else and sets us apart is this community. And that is when that all really had an opportunity to bring in non-developers and design and all the things. And so I would, I know you did the first one ever, so mm -hmm. I'm saying, please do this back <laughs> future you. And so, yes, that's it's my pretty, answer. It was pretty early, 2006. That was pretty early. If you want to see some of the story of that, check out my blog, ma.tt. Um, I posted a blog post a few days ago called, I love WordCamps, because <laughs> I do. And uh, that's one of my favorite days of the year. And a little bit of the story about how WordCamp got started, the inspiration for the name, everything. So if you want to get some little tidbits of history, check that out. As you're choosing the next one, I'm going to tell everyone, don't worry, we're going to answer these questions later. <laughs> oh, yeah, the ones we don't get to now, we'll put online, right? Yes, as always. Cool. Yep. You want to read this one, the Darren one? Yes. Hey, Matt, as you think of the longevity of WordPress, what is your succession plan for your leadership and vision in the project? Ah. From Darren. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. Uh, my vision is it outlasting me, for sure. Uh, it, someone replied it was morbid, but uh, uh, you might have seen, actually, you know, one thing that as our community has gone longer and longer, we deal with all parts of life. We have new babies born. We have... People who were babies now start to contribute to WordPress. <laughs> we have kids camps. Um, 
we also, you know, have some people who we've lost. Yes. And uh, we now have a page at wordpress.org slash remembers. So wordpress.org remembers uh, to honor those people who were part members of the community, members of people who contributed, who organized things, who were really part of this tribe of people who choose to care about the mission of WordPress. A uh, place where we can, you know, have their name, link to their website, uh, link to their profile, tell a little bit about them. And when we posted this, I said, you know, I'm going to be on this page someday. <laughs> so I was like, oh, Matt. But I actually meant it in a really positive way. And that I hope that, hopefully not soon, <laughs> but that someday this page is going to far outlive me and be something that, and when we designed the page, we actually thought, okay, how do we make this something that, you know, can be around for many decades to come? Uh, so uh, how I think about it is much how we approach this long-term thinking. So like what are, what's really key to, what's the magic that makes WordPress work? That's right. Um, what are structures that are really conducive to iteration? What are structures that get us kind of wound around our axle <laughs> sometimes? Um, what, uh, what does good leadership look like? Uh, where do we mess it up sometimes when we try new things? Where do we, uh, where has it gone really well? And um, yeah, that, that's all I've got to, for that for so far. Okay. Great. Another AI question for you. Do you want to do a not AI question? I... Uh, for maybe 10 minutes? <laughs> we could do it. Uh, well, yeah, let's see. Any plans? More, or do you have any just more relational? Um, yeah, we can go through some of these quickly. Um, any plans to utilize or create prototyping tools such as Figma or Paint Pot in order to get from the design tool straight to WordPress? Um, I actually think, I'm not familiar with Paint Pot, Neither so this is my first time hearing about that. I'll yeah. check it out. Um, Figma is really cool. Um, I think just got bought by Adobe. Um, proprietary tool, but really, really effective. We've been using it a lot. Um, I have seen some like Figma to Gutenberg uh, translators. I think that's going to be a very cool area. Um, and if we don't, maybe we should have like an importer or canonical plugin for that in the future because I think that is really kind of interesting. Um, I also think one thing that's really cool, particularly as we get these collaboration features in Gutenberg, is you might be able to do some of the stuff directly in Gutenberg, which would be really interesting and really cool as well. So right now Figma is, in my experience, one of the best around this collaborative design editing, and you can bring design systems and other things. But when you can be kind of closer to the code and the CSS and everything, like you don't need a Figma representation of your design system or a ways to translate that into code if you're just able to do it all with the blocks of Gutenberg. So that's how I think about it. Cool, thank you for that question. You wanna read the next one? Do you plan to do anything about making WordPress SQL databases more relational, sorry it moved, have different tables for different post types in the near future? Uh, no. <laughs> Nailed it. Next question. Uh, well, <laughs> to a longer answer is something like the fields API or other ways of leveraging, um, particularly as like new versions of MySQL or MariaDB, or maybe even canonical plugins for things like Elasticsearch, a lot of different types of querying. When you think about it, most WordPress databases are not that big. Um, I also think that for plugins that are doing more interesting things, like you know, WooCommerce is moving to the high performance order tables, or order system, order, what's the S stand for? Order storage, uh, which is basically like a custom table for orders. Um, there might be data models which are good to move out of the post sort of structure, but um, as soon as you go with a table there, like all of a sudden you're doing like different, like, what happens to comments? What happens to post meta? What happens to like all the other things that are built on the post? And post can actually scale to like tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions. So a lot of good stuff fits in there. And it's really about, to me, like the usage model for where you should move it out. It says what's good for you, so I'll, I'll read it if you want to kick off on it. Yes. When we talk about diversity, what about language oh, diversity? Yeah. We have events and big community outside of the English language. Are there any efforts to improve this? Yes, immediately. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I agree that we need to um, start having more word camps, meetups, all the things in languages outside of English. Fortunately, we currently are doing the 
hate to say it, next generation exploration. <laughs> <laughs> da, da, da. Oh, what's, how's the next generation thing go? It's Star Trek. Anyone want to sing Star Trek real fast? Oh, yes. da, 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 da. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, yeah. So there is an exploration going on about that right now. And I do absolutely think uh, that we have space for language-centric word camps. We had, I think, one, maybe two during the pandemic, and they were really well received. They were really well attended. And I, and I think that we absolutely need more of those. And so, yeah, I think that we need them. And there is currently a discussion happening to advocate for those. And I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice that we start with a yes after a no answer. Uh, should future work camps have more talks on business and marketing? Do you want to one, two, three it and see if we agree? Sure. One, two, three. Yes. Maybe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yes, propose one. So please don't think that there is like people who are speakers at work camps and people who aren't. We are all <laughs> potential work camp speakers. And each one of you has something interesting to say. Each one of you has a story. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of you have beautiful stories about business and marketing. Propose that as a talk. Yes. I'd love to see more of it in the future. Yeah. That was a five minute timer noise for us. Cool. From Jonathan. Um, how can we attract, I'll read this. Do you want to answer this one? How can we attract more experts from tangentially related to disciplines to contribute and become more involved in making WordPress better. Tangentially related, as opposed to the things that uh, it's but directly that related. What do you mean trans tangential tangentially? Oh, I mm. see, I see, I see. Um, yeah, you know, WordPress as a project, and you've said this for years, we have a lot of difficulty getting outside of ourselves. We really love being in here. Mm -hmm. It's really welcoming. <laughs> Everyone's super nice. We really want everyone to know how to do everything easily and well and with us. And so it's very difficult to get outside of, of our bubbles. And so we do, I think, lose a lot of that really smart kind of opportunity from people that are in the Drupal community. Although I know that we have like five of you with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Including I, Abby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I think, I, I think taking our, our knowledge that we have from the WordPress project, whether it's PHP, JavaScript, our, our, our success with Gutenberg, and taking it out into other communities is a yeah. really great way to do that because they don't know how to find us either. And so if yeah. we go to them, that's a great way to do it. Yeah, and something I'll personally try to contribute here, and you saw some experiments with it at this WordCamp US, was uh, having both Ken Liu talks and Simon Willison's. Um, Simon being maybe the first, maybe last speaker that doesn't run WordPress for his website yet. <laughs> he has a custom CMS on it. It's pretty cool. But someday, maybe. <laughs> but we'll be, maybe 10 years from now. We'll, we'll, we'll be around. Don't worry. Um, the, that, that, so on my part, I, I do a lot of reading, a lot of um, spending time in other communities. And I will try my best to try to bring in some uh, speakers from outside and to some of these flagship events. U.S. is probably the easiest, but I'll think about Asia and Europe as well, um, to see if we can bring us with different perspectives, whether they're tangentially related or not. Great. What is the biggest lesson you've learned in your professional lives over the past two years to the two of us? Ten years, Heart. yeah. Heart. Oh, sorry, past ten years. What did I say? Uh, two years? Mm -hmm. My bad. Uh, huh. I'm going to start with an answer so you can Go think. It, yeah. All right. Um, one of the things that did not come naturally to me when I started learning, uh, when I started leading, was learning how to, to keep people with me and with the project that we were working on when we were doing things that were very hard. Um, and fortunately, by the time we got to Gutenberg, I, I kind of had an idea because uh, that was very hard for the community. Uh, and, and so I have learned not necessarily like how to prevent all of the problems or all the crises, um, but certainly how to, when you encounter them, because we can't predict the future, um, what to do when you get there. And it's, it was really basic stuff when I started. It was things like thank people when you find that they're in a really tough time with you, um, when you are there helping with the tough time, like be clearly there, like say, I'm here, I'm helping. I don't know if I can help, but I'm here to try. Um, and the third thing that was really clear to me later was that, um, especially when I'm the one who created the problem, because I do that sometimes. I have really big ideas. And then I'm like, hey, developers, can we make zebras out of WordPress? And they're like, yee, yee. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, they promise a lot of stuff to me, I think, that maybe is not, not uh, uh, the best. Um, but when I do come to people with a problem that I absolutely am not capable of having a solution for, I make a lot of effort to to be available as early as possible so that they have an opportunity to ask me all the questions so they can understand it well enough to make their own autonomous choices as best they can. Um, and, and, you know, that's it. Like, just be clearly there and doing the thing. That's the thing that was the hardest for me to learn was how to help people through difficult times, um, and especially when I was the one creating the difficult time, because then I just felt bad about it. So, yeah. Mm. I think my answer is, is actually kind of related to that, oh. or maybe inspired by that. Um, around the importance of communication. Mm. And for me, that was, you know, I think it's Frank Luntz who says, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. Yes, it's what they receive. Yeah. And so the importance of like, if someone doesn't understand you, you know, the onus is on you to think about how you communicated it and go back to that. Uh, I was studying things like nonviolent communication. And also I'll say like, um, so much of communicating is about listening. And I've been doing a lot of work and listening in the past 10 years um, that I think has been really remunerative in terms of like, you know, understanding better what the needs of y'all, sort of having a pulse on the community a bit. Um, and I, if you haven't tried meditation, uh, I recommend it as great apps like Calm or um, uh, Waking Up, I think by Sam Harris. Like there's a lot of really good ones. Uh, it's kind of nice because you don't actually need anything. <laughs> you can read a blog post about it or a book or go to a retreat. There's a million different ways to do it. But all of them, I find, um, are great for creating that awareness that allows you to both connect with your thoughts and truly be present and listen to someone else um, in a way that's really important for communication. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll summarize that TLDR is uh, try meditation. <laughs> uh, I think that was our last question because I think you have some Thank yous and goodbyes over on that slide. Oh, awesome. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Josepha. Thank, thank you. you all for the great questions.